Hi, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts. And I'm here with my week of reading wrap up where I talk about the books that I read, what I'm currently reading, and possibly could read next week. Uh, I read some phenomenal books and hands down one of my new favorites. So I'm really excited to share them all with you. Uh, so first up, uh, this is Victober, as you know, and uh, Victober means we read Victorian literature, right? So I had my first experience with Anne Bronte, and this is The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Um, I did this in audio, but I loved it so much. I bought this uh, used copy uh, to own for myself because I can tell that I'm going to come back to it. And I... I was thinking and reflecting that I think that I have uh, experienced the Brontes through the avenues and, and time frames in my life where it was most advantageous. So as an example, I read Wuthering Heights uh, in the, I'm, oh no, I'm not gonna say what decade. <laughs> um, I read Wuthering Heights when I was, you know, a young, um, adolescent, uh, really uh, hormonal and all, all the huge feelings that exist and romantic and and idealistic and everything was big and, and, and intense, which really suited Wuthering Heights, right? Uh, plus Kate Bush. I was a huge Kate Bush fan. Uh, so, but if I read it now, I would be horrified. <laughs> Probably should have been a little more horrified, but I was less of a um, critical thinker and reader back then, right? Um, and then I read Jane Eyre, moved on to Jane Eyre a little, uh, a few years later when I was a little bit more mature, kind of a, a moving into my, maybe my 20s. And I really responded to Jane and her steadfastness and her character. Um, I think I would uh, now would have said, oh my God, run from Rochester. <laughs> like he's like, no, 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 no. But you know, at that moment, still less critical reader kind of swept in the moment. I read Villette a couple of Victobers ago and it is a more staid, um, more adult story of, of this woman and kind of the relationships and uh, romantic attachments that she that she makes, uh, I think it would have completely not enjoyed it as a as a younger person. I didn't entirely love it. Um, you know, it was okay, but this I think is the best, <laughs> in my humble opinion. And and I think, but I also think that if I read this when I was younger, it would have been too slow. It would have been too, uh, yeah, too slow, especially in the reveal, especially in the the detailing of details to get us to the point where we understood what was the problem and what was happening. Um, this is the story. Uh, it's really a story told in two parts by two voices. Uh, interestingly enough, we have we open with a man, Gilbert Markham, and he is a wealthy young man, marriageable age. All the women love him. He's got a bunch of, of he seems to be a little bit of a player, um, but he catches the eye of the new tenant of Wildfell Hall. You guessed it. And her name is Heather Graham and her young son. Assuming that she's a widow, uh, she wears black, you know, all of all, you know, kind of all of those trappings. He is writing in response. It, it, he's writing to a friend of his and he's kind of detailing him on all the things that are that are happening and uh, uh, specifically uh, who this woman is and what his response to her is. So we open with that uh, and then we also end with that. So it kind of frames up the story. It's kind of his his um, recollections and observations. Uh, and she's very much of a mystery and she acts in ways that are counter to what he knows and expects. She's very skittish, very protective of her son, uh, very secretive, uh, and he doesn't really understand why. Uh, and it's you know he's a pampered rich guy. He doesn't. He's he cannot possibly fathom why a woman <laughs> wouldn't just want to be entirely sociable all the time, uh, which is a theme 
with this with this book is these men who just don't understand the the female experience and or try to be saviors. Uh, then we flip and we get her perspective uh, told through her diaries. Uh, she wants to be understood. Uh, she feels that there is a, a possibility of a friendship with this man, uh, with Mr. Markham. And, but she also can't spend a lot of time with him or be seen spending a lot of time with him and doesn't want to be put in a position to have to, un to unveil all of her story. So instead she gives him her diary to read. And then we go straight into her voice. But as you can see, it takes, there's a long setup to get to the point where we hear from Helen. And so I can see myself uh, at my earlier self uh, kind of jumping ship um, with, the, with this kind of uh, voice of this uh, Mr. Markham. But I'm glad I, I stayed through. What we learn is the backstory of a very, very unhappy marriage. Uh, she married for love. Um, and, uh, and it was really a poor, a poor decision. Uh, she didn't really know him. And, and there's questions of, of alcoholism, adultery, a mental abuse, uh, restriction, uh, 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 abuse of the child, uh, meant cruelty, a lot of cruelty, uh, that are in here. Um, and, and, but it's in these, in these moments where it just kind of adds up and adds up and adds up. Uh, I found it to be very realistic, very slow, but a determined narrative. And I think probably one of the more realistic narratives. I've always found uh, David Copperfield, the story of, of David's stepfather and the abuse and control that he put on uh, David and his mother to be one of the best descriptions of that kind of abuse in literature. And I think this also is, is one as well. And of course, this is Victorian literature. So it's, this wasn't really talked about then. And especially alcoholism is also something that appears here. And as I mentioned before, the men's, the male savior complex, um, and the idea that these men feel that just because they're, they're, showing grace and being compassionate means that obviously the woman should just naturally fall in love with them. Just oh, sometimes uh, men, sometimes. Uh, and this is one of those stories where you can see how she's really in a position and she cannot trust people because of the way that they could abuse that or infer more things based on that trust. So I thought it was amazing. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. One of my, I say one of my favorite Victorian reads uh, so far since doing Victober. Kind of stands there up there with um, kind of what I think is the penultimate for me, which is Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South. So that was great. A good start to the week. Then I decided to go back through my net galley because I've been a little woeful in in keeping up with all of the books that are coming out. And I saw that this one is coming out and in fact is out now. This is The Golden Gate by Amy Chua. And I have to say this was a, a fantastic surprise. This is her first novel and I think she did a very good job. This is rich, rich in details about Berkeley and San Francisco in the 1940s and a little earlier. So it's set in 1944. And the main place that, that it's kind of a folk, plays a, a focal point is the Claremont Hotel, which you can see from almost anywhere in Berkeley. It's up in the Berkeley Hills and it's this beautiful white building that's kind of like this beacon. You can even see it as you're coming across the Bay Bridge from San Francisco. And there's a murder that takes place there. And our main character is a detective, Detective Al Sullivan. And Al is called, is actually there at the Claremont um, having dinner with someone, uh, this young, beautiful, very rich woman that he is kind of surprised to be having dinner with or having drinks with, I think is what they were doing. And a very, very important man is found dead. 
This man is is running has run for president. He is uh, rumored to be having an affair with Madame Chiang Kai Shek uh, of China. Uh, so this is right as Mao is uh, is kind of fighting for control, and this is rich with details about Madame Chiang Kai Shek's uh, legacy. She was a really, really interesting person and spent a lot of time in the United States. Uh, and so she's here in San Francisco and she actually had a home in Berkeley, but she was seen at the Claremont. So you've got international political intrigue, always interesting to me. Um, but then you have all this richness of detail about Berkeley and San Francisco. Um, what this, as the, he is starting to, to uncover this very, very politically dangerous murder mystery that he's trying to investigate, he comes across some details that actually hearken to an earlier death that happened at the Claremont of a young girl, Iris Stafford. And now Iris is the daughter of the Stafford family, which was a very prominent, very important family in San Francisco um, and who had moved over to Berkeley, uh, one of the kind of the, the big families. And it, it had never really been solved. Uh, so it's so he's kind of has these dual timelines that he's trying to trying to work out, but they are connected. Now this is set in the forties. And so there's a lot, she did, I think she did a really, really good job at being able to talk about some of, and use some of the language and use some of the, the uh, prevalent norms of the time, but also shed our, our light from nowadays onto why that's so problematic or what the inherent contradictions and hypocrisies of those types of thinking are. Uh, and she does it through character, she does it through experience of these characters, which I think was very interesting. There's a lot packed in here, a lot on class, a lot on race, things about um, the Japanese internment um, and, and the police's involvement with that, uh, things about um, Mexican, Mexican immigration, things about Oakland and the boom of Oakland as this port that was building all of these ships for uh, sale in the Pacific during the war and how that brought a, a huge amount of black Americans for the opportunities. And yet Oakland hadn't planned on housing them. <laughs> And so this this idea of of you know the rules of where people can live, where they're not allowed to live, uh, all of these things that we don't even think about, and also the Golden Gate was just built, and what that did to to um, bridge San Francisco and and Marin and the East Bay, just really interesting focus time period. Uh, and very well crafted. So if you like murder mysteries, this would be great. But also I think if you're interested in in this area of the country and specifically at that time, uh, you know, this was a fun way to explore all of that. So I hope she has a lot of success with this with this book. Then let me tell you about the best thing that I read this week. And this might even be one of the best I've read all year. Oh, I loved this book. This is The Slaves of Solitude by Patrick Hamilton. And look at that cover. Oh, so good. So good. Um, I have a few people to thank for putting this kind of on my radar. So first is Nora. She uh, started Spinster September and she's on Instagram as uh, Pear Jelly. I'll put a link to her handle below. The other person is Jennifer, who is also on Instagram as the tireless reader. And she did something so brilliant. I was captivated the entire month. She kept um, wearing outfits based on different spinsters. Uh, it's like this, this elevated cosplay. I was like, oh, this is phenomenal. And so she, at one point she dressed up like the main character, Miss Brooch. And I loved what she said. And she said it was one of her favorite characters. And I, so I started to investigate and I remember hearing Patrick Hamilton before. Um, there was a book about London uh, that I've been interested in reading, but I didn't, I hadn't heard about this book. So I immediately got it out of the library and started reading it on my Kindle. Uh, and it's 
phenomenal. So first off, uh, London and and this kind of like outpost of London, kind of, it's not really the suburbs, it's kind of like a borough, kind of a more outer borough, is almost a character in this book. Um, the, the atmosphere is so, so well done. We have Miss Roach, who is a middle-aged woman who works for a publishing company, who previously lived in London, but because of the blitz, because of the bombing, she's been relocated kind of to this uh, different area and she's living in a boarding home. And the boarding home is very, is filled with all sorts of characters and has its own rules of decorum and its own set of um, expectations. Uh, there's a flow of the day. There's certain things that happen at certain times. There's certain seating arrangements. All of these things happen and are maintained uh, through the will and dominance often of this one character who's probably one of the meanest, worst, uh, obnoxious, needling bullies that I've read uh, recently in literature. So you're used to bullies being uh, maybe bosses or bullies in, well, kids are in school and in college, you know, those types of bullies, workplace bullies. But this was a whole different element. This was somebody who took a dislike to Miss Roach. His name is Mr. Thwaite. And he took an instant dislike to Miss Roach and he proceeds to taunt her, to belittle her, to use every single opportunity to just needle her and, and, and put her under his microscope whenever they see each other in the dining room. They have to sit at the same table with a few other people. Um, and he always speaks loud enough so that other people can hear. And so it's almost a performance. Um, and it makes her crazy. <laughs> One evening she's in the dining room and there are two Americans who are not in the boarding house, but they're having a meal with in the, um, in the dining room that night. And she catches the eye of one of the lieutenants and he asks her out for a drink and takes her and, and they go out to a local pub. They start to see each other on a semi-regular basis, but he's completely uh, a mystery to her. Uh, he doesn't act in the ways that she would expect. He's not regular, although he's very doting. Um, he tells her all about himself. He, he makes her feel very special. He makes her feel very important, but she's intrigued. Um, now he is a very, very big drinker. So is it alcohol? Is it war? Is it personality? Is it this Americanism? <laughs> is this a, a feature of Americans that they just talk like this and act like this? Uh, so she's really on the back foot and doesn't really know how to, how to respond to him. Um, and especially as she's already on the back foot because of all of the pummeling done by Mr. Thwaite. She meets a German woman uh, who is also single and uh, about her age, and they become friendly. And she ends up uh, finding that Vicky is kind of encroaching more and more and more into her life. And so she uh, finds herself defensive, and but then questioning, is that, a, is that right? Is that fair? Um, so our, you know, we just have this really strong, wonderfully moral character, this wonderful woman who is smart and capable and, and, but, but is, is completely out of her element. So we think in this environment and it kind of pushes her beyond where she would normally go. And that is what we explore in this book. And it was fantastic. It was fantastic. And I, and I, and I can, I can say without ruining anything that the ending was magnificent. The ending was so exactly what I wanted. Um, and it's fantastic because you're just like, feel so much for this woman in each little incremental, uh, defeat that she's given over and over and over again. Um, so an ending like she got was just fantastic. So uh, thank you, Nora and Jennifer, for introducing me to what is by far one of one of the best books I've read in ages. 
then I guess I'm truly becoming a short story reader. <laughs> My quest this year to explore the short story uh, format uh, has led me to a an author that I've always been curious about because I have this stunningly gorgeous book here that I've been meaning to read, but I've always been intimidated. And this is Clarice Lispector's huge tome. This is her collection of work. It's uh, complete stories. But you know how I feel about short stories. So hence, it has not been cracked open yet. But uh, New Direction um, has a, a an imprint called Storybook ND. This is where I got my Helen DeWitt uh, edition. Uh, they did a Clarice Lispector uh, story bound up like this, uh, and it's called The Woman Who Killed the Fish. And so I found that on my from my library and checked it out. It's really a collection of four little stories, and I have to say I'm completely charmed. I'm completely charmed by her voice. Uh, the, the theme of these stories were really animals and humans' relationship to animals. And told, and it feels like it, it was her kind of writing stories for her children uh, as they're growing up, um, maybe grandchildren, maybe family members, friends, children, but it definitely has that vibe of, of something that's being, that's being created for children, but not really childlike. Um, and I found her her voice to be really straightforward as if she's just talking to you. Um, what she was choosing to write about was really interesting and fun. And as I said, really charming. So I don't have anything specific to say about the four stories. I just found them interesting. I enjoyed her voice as I was reading them. And it makes me really excited to get into that collection. So yay, I'm feeling very proud of myself. <laughs> Okay, so now let's talk about what I'm currently reading. I have um, gone into this one. This is my big tome of, of the month. This is Deerbrook by Harriet Martineau on that gorgeous cover. Um, so I am annotating it. I'm reading this slowly, I'm, but I'm enjoying it so much. And what I find so interesting about this one is that so often it takes me a while to understand all of the characters in Victorian novels because propriety dictates that people act in a very similar ways. So it's sometimes it's hard for me to get a real good read on the different characters and to be able to separate them out quickly, especially when you get a flood of names. But in this case, we meet the two sisters that are coming to stay. Uh, with the family in Deerbrook. They are have a completely different way of, of operating and thinking about the world than their family members that they're staying with, uh, their cousins, and aunt and uncle. And I'm completely sold on the fact that there's a potential love interest named Mr. Hope. <laughs> that's just, that's fantastic. So enjoying this. Continuing on with Some Trick by Helen DeWitt. Uh, this is a collection of short stories. Look at me. Um, and I would say there was one in here. It was the first one of this section that we read on the town. And it featured an, a young man from Iowa who moved to New York City for the first time. And New York City just seems to be laying out the red carpet for him wherever he goes and with every single interaction. Now, he's an exceptional young man from Iowa that did a lot of interesting things. Um, and it's very clear that he didn't really belong in Iowa, but the, the, the life lessons he got there are very applicable and are giving him cachet and entree into places he otherwise would not be able to get into. And I loved it specifically because it reminded me so much of my experience in coming to San Francisco and just being awed at how one connection leads to another, leads to another. Next thing you know, I'm spending time with people that I could only have dreamt about, uh, meeting amazing, interesting people and uh, having conversations I always dreamt of having and doing things that were far more sophisticated than I, than I had when I was growing up in, uh, in spending my, my teenage years in Delaware. So uh, so that, that story in and of itself has made this collection so good for me. Then on audio, I'm listening to another brand new release. This is Brooklyn Crime Novel by Jonathan Lethem. 
uh, I am really enjoying the audio version of this. It's this is set in Brooklyn and it's set in the starts in the 70s. And it's a real interesting look at a neighborhood and what makes a neighborhood, all of the the ways that people grow up in this neighborhood and the different people and their experience of the neighborhood. Uh, but the neighborhood is the focus. And I just love pl really place specific novels. So uh, this and the nostalgia piece is really working for me so far. So that's what I'm reading. And then I also want to tee up, I'm not going to do a special video for this, but I did make an announcement on Instagram that I am hosting uh, a group read for these books. Uh, I'll get them out of the glare. This is Toni Morrison. This is seven books in a row that we're going to read between the beginning of November and the beginning of February. So we're going to have, what's that, three months to read these books together. Uh, this is part of my author spotlight series. And what I, what we do in this series is I read with like the most amazing, brilliant, smartest people ever. We have one check in a week on Sundays and Sunday means whatever, you know, midnight to midnight Sunday is in your part of the world. And we, we reflect on what we've read so far up to that point. We've all agreed and decided that we are in it for the long haul, that our Sunday salon, as someone called them, is something that's important to all of us. And we'd like to open it up if you'd like to join. Uh, so we are going to take these at a good clip. And um, I think the reading for each week will probably be no more than 180 pages. But we're going to read and then discuss Toni Morrison's work, which I'm so excited. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting because there's a mix of people from around the world. I know some people who are in Europe and um, in Australia and in other parts of the world are excited to be group reading this with people in America so they can get some of the American context. I'm really curious as to what they bring into the, into the, the reading experience. Uh, so these are deep readers, uh, thoughtful readers, and we all are really committed to this, to showing up for this group. So I'm, I'm, if that sounds like your cup of tea, uh, please consider joining us uh, on this. I, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. I, if you leave a comment that you want to join, that's not enough. I'm going to put a link to a sign up form. You have to use the sign up form because I've had so, I have a few different places I've been talking about this in social media, and um, it's a quick recipe for disaster if people leave comments and random videos and posts and things all around. So I'm only taking uh, the people who are on that sign up sheet. The other caveat is that you have to have a Voxer account. So we do this on Voxer, which is a free app that we use, and it allows for either speaking into the into the microphone and leaving a text mess, uh, a voice message or leaving a te text message. Um, and you just kind of leave it there and then you can read other people's and respond and all of that. So I think that's all I had to say. I, I hope you would consider. Uh, I have, an, we're gonna be doing this through the year. So I already have the full year of reading and different authors that we'll be exploring set up through the end of next year. So I'm very, very excited of uh, every single Sunday checking in with everyone. So that's it for me for now. Thank you so much for watching. I would love to know if you've read any of the books I mentioned and what your thoughts were. And I really hope you have a fantastic week of reading ahead of you. I look forward to talking to you soon. Bye-bye.